Year 14. The Rule of the Good Professor. Fragments of a journal recovered from a dwarven corpse. The body has been brutally mauled by multiple blows from heavy, blunt objects. First of Limestone, 117. I arrived to take command of the fortress head shoots today after a long journey from the mountain homes. The Countess is currently in residence here, and the leaders of the mountain homes had expressed their doubts about the abilities of the past leaders. With good reason, I think, as I was greeted by a fortress in the least dwarf-like disarray I had ever witnessed. At least the place was made of stone. Storming into the center of the fortress, my faithful squire, Robert Dedford, at my side, I demanded to speak with the current leader. Instead of a warm reception I would normally expect, I was greeted by the captain of the guard and a veritable horde of stray animals. I quickly told him the situation, and he told me that a dwarf named Spooky Lizard was currently in command of the fortress. I ordered her brought before me with as much haste as possible. I met Spooky Lizard in the hallway where I stood, and to my surprise, she immediately acquiesced to my demands. Clearly, this dwarf was weak-willed and ill-suited to the position of overseer. I promptly assumed command, and ordered all the stray animals butchered for food. Having not seen the Countess nor Consort around, I asked as to their location, and after much prying, I extracted the information from a hauler. The Countess had been locked in her room by order of one of the fortress overseers, and the processing lever pulled twice. Worrying I was too late, I quickly commanded the door unlocked and carefully opened by the same hauler. Luckily... The room in which she was locked was full of water, not magma, as I had seen in some of the insurrectionist forts I have brought to task. I immediately ordered my squire to imprison Spooky Lizard, recognizing that the fortress guard may have been loyal to her and her dastly plots. I shall have to watch the guard and the military carefully from now on. I have no wish to have a wall quietly erected around my door while I sleep. Eighth of Limestone, 117. Today I uncovered another of the failings of this fortress. The stores of drink have been reduced to a mere thirteen barrels. I ordered the stills to maximum production, and I pray the brewers will get to work before this turns to crisis. Thirteenth of Limestone, 117. Having been besieged by near-constant reports of zombie mountain goats scaring the peasants and the apparent unwillingness of the standing military to deal with them, I vowed to personally hunt down and end this undead annoyance. I think it went rather well. 24th of Limestone This place is a sprawling horror. One of the previous overseers had ordered vast stretches of stone, excavated in no discernible pattern, for no recognizable reason. I've heard there was adamantine in the depths, so I ordered the first miner I came across, a dwarf by the name of Otto Print, to lead me there to see if there was any more that was safe to extract. I ordered a significant quantity, mind out, and my dwarven senses were telling me that we were at least a few yards away from breaching the demon caverns that undoubtedly lay beyond. Third of Sandstone I received an urgent message from a runner today. A goblin snatcher has been spotted creeping towards the fortress by Rotenage, an engraver. I cast about for my hammer and had the dwarf lead me to the goblin's last known location, but on the way I met a group of three champions returning to the barracks. Goblin blood splashed across their adamantine armor. They assured me the scum had been taken care of. It's good to know that, despite the other failures of head shoots, the military is well in order when needed. Fifth of Sandstone No migrants have arrived since I came to this fortress. I'm not particularly worried. After all, I would not expect any more to leave the mountain homes for head shoots until word of my safe arrival reaches them, at the very least. 
ninth of sandstone. I removed certain of the old leaders from their tombs today and designated them as the eventual resting places for myself and my faithful squire Robert Dedford. Worry not, their remains were disposed of with all the ceremony required of a past leader. I've also ordered the excavation of a monument to my leadership and to the strength of the mountain homes, lest this remote hell forget where it came from. 21st of Sandstone I was awakened from my slumber this night by a mechanic named The Belgian. Stoically bearing the pain of a badly burned leg, he told me he had stumbled across this zombie fire imp that had been scaring the peasants of late. Apparently, it had chased him across half the surface of the fortress before he managed to lose it. I ordered a squad of champions to the location he gave, and grabbing my hammer, rushed to join them. Arriving before any of the rest, I spotted the shambling beast and gave chase. The fiend, focused on chasing down a hauler, didn't notice me until I was directly beside it. Its rotten brain and failing reflexes were no match for my honed skill, and I brought it down with two blows of my hammer. 24th of Sandstone I received word Spooky Lizard had succumbed to starvation, her body found in a remote room walled off from the rest of the fortress. Judging her adequately punished, I allowed the wall to be removed so she could be placed in her tomb. 27th of Sandstone Horrors! Demons in the deeps! Swatchester is rustling with the spirit of fire. He lost. I hurriedly order all nearby dwarves into the military, and direct the champions to the last spotted location of the demon. Valley is in one of these clouds of smoke. She died instantly. Sadly, we were too late to save two dwarves. Swatchester and Valley perished to the fire spirit's evil flames. Traxus the Fourth was the first champion to reach the demon. Wielding his battle axe with great alacrity and skill, he beheaded the fiend with a single stroke. I note that to properly defend head shoots, I must carefully check over the adamantine mines to see where this fiend came from. Perhaps it's time I led an expedition of champions to cleanse the pits. Third of Timber, 117. I received word today that an engraver in the fortress had become possessed. He quickly claimed a craft dwarf's workshop and set to work gathering his materials, ignoring all else. Seventh of Timber. Angered by the recent demon attacks, I vowed we would clear the areas above the pits of their foul stench and claim the adamantine they hoarded against us. We would smith new weapons and armor and take the fight all the way to their horrible dens if we must. I began to rally the troops, readying the breach in the wall. Eighth of Timber. Snatchers! The fortress has had a fairly steady problem with goblin scum attempting to breach our defenses. Luckily, Mortal Sword, a fish dissector, was there to spot him. The dwarf immediately pounced upon the goblin and destroyed him. I mean, really destroyed him. Whatever one might say about head shoots, the populace knows their duty and are uh, not afraid to defend themselves. Fourteenth of Timber Behold, Thebil Nunok, the Silky Number. This is an Orpiment Ring. All craft dwarf ship is of the highest quality. It is encrusted with Prace, and encircled with bands of Orpiment. This object is adorned with hanging rings of Prace, and menaces with spikes of Orpiment, and Dogbone. On the item is an image of a mule in Dogbone. On the item is an image of a wild strawberry in gold opal. On the item is an image of mules in gold opal. On the item is an image of a valley herb in cave spider silk. I was just told by a hauler that Frederick II finally finished construction of his artifact. It's named the Silky Number. But it's no piece of elven-inspired clothing, as you might expect. It is, in fact, a ridiculously ornate piece of orpiment jewelry. 22nd of Timber. The image has been hastily scratched out. Zombie mountain goats, in the monument of my rule and the glory of the mountain homes. Malin, the clothier who discovered it, was able to subdue it without a scratch. 
after a long while. Unfortunately, copper picks are not the most effective weapon when you are a simple, unskilled mining laborer. Luckily, Crackmaster, and more importantly, Judenhauer, showed up to finish it off. I'd etched an image to commemorate their victory over the undead fiend, but it showed more of the monument than I'm willing to. Twelfth of Moonstone The breaching of the demon pits is going well. I've erected a drawbridge over the lava chasm, controlled by a lever a few yards away, in case we're consumed by the foul dwellers below. There's also a second drawbridge along the pass to the pits, much for the back, in the event the demons take the surrounding area too quickly for us to pull the lever. So far, I've seen no sign of the fiends who inhabit them. I can only surmise that they're hiding like cowards in their glowing abyss, too scared of true dwarven might to surface. Our champions, myself included, camp here, mere feet of stone separating us from the level below. I've marked all the pikes and cages, empty, thank God, for removal and repurposing, and have had a wall built to seal off the pits themselves. We will gradually mine out the adamantine surrounding the pit, and replace it with worked granite. I was brought a message today that a cobalt thief was spotted on the outskirts of the fortress by Skay, a weaver. Knowing that the military was currently engaged in the purging of the glowing pits, he simply chased down the cobalt, grabbed it by the leg, and crushed its chest beneath his large rat-leather shoes. Smuggins, the dungeon master, cancels Forge Adamantine Gauntlet, needs Adamantine Wafers. The Dungeon dungeon Master, master, Smuggins, is seriously beginning to annoy me with his constant complaints of a lack of materials. Smuggins, the Dungeon Master, cancels Forge Adamantine High Boot. Were he of lesser standing, I would undoubtedly order him imprisoned for... A time, but alas, he is noble, and it would not be proper. I've instructed my squire to watch him carefully for me, however, lest he do something that might compromise his position. On another note, a second cobalt thief ambushed the Countess, V. Elish L., as she was on a walk of the countryside. She rightfully ran away, the kobold continuing in his quest for the riches of head shoots. He had the misfortune of running into Tyskill, the champion, as the dwarf filled his water skin. The hapless kobold was knocked at least thirty feet by the champion's hammer. We all had a good laugh at that once he returned to watch the pits and told the story. 26th of Moonstone Wondering why none of the excavations in the adamantine mines were being done, I sent a runner to find Judenhauer. Eventually, he was located in the prison of all places. The runner returned with the news that he'd apparently violated a production order set by the Countess herself. God knows how Judenhauer caught the blame for that, as mining isn't exactly production as far as I know. I do not know if the nobles here are deliberately infuriating their most law-abiding subject, or if they were simply sent here as punishment for unthoughtful things said in the presence of those more influential than they. Twentieth of Obsidian. Smuggins, the dungeon master, Smuggins has kept up his whining for altogether too long. In addition, White Cloak the Hearth Lord has been taken by a fey mood and claimed a leatherworks. We shall see what he produces. I've kept watch over the demon pits for months now. I'm beginning to think we've killed all the fiends from that pit. Fortunately, the mining is finally beginning to be done, and Judenhauer's prison sentence will soon end. I've ordered the construction of sturdy stone walls around the pit, so the miners can work without fear of horrible fiends bursting from the abyss. 24th of Obsidian I've allowed the righteous barricade and the constructs of light to stand down, as the pits seem quiet. The wall is progressing slowly, as is draining the lava. I received 
disturbing news today. The Countess apparently decided that 46 days of prison was not enough punishment for Judenhauer, and ordered him several blows of the hammer. This had roughly the effect you would expect. I'm insulted that the nobility here would put their bourgeois pride over the life of the fortress's most accomplished miner. This is not in the spirit of the mountain homes. What's perhaps even worse is that no one has even seen fit to move his body to his tomb. Someone will pay for this injustice. Eleventh of Granite Robin Daybird found a kobold skulking around the fortress perimeter and elected to kill it herself rather than call for the military. On her way back to the safety of Headshoot's walls, she happened to stumble across a second thief. Unfortunately, this one ran away with great speed and slipped out of sight before Robin Daybird was able to catch it, though she did chase it all the way to the eastern brook. I commend her bravery. Fifteenth of Granite. Mining was finally beginning to progress near the demon pits. I had a plan to drain the last one of the lava pockets into the abyss, hopefully frying a fiend or two, though I'm not sure they'll be affected by the heat. But suddenly I was interrupted by a runner from the surface. An ambush. Curse them. I hastily donned my armor and commanded the other two active squads of champions to defend the fortress. Scouts reported that the goblins were spending time killing off the zombified wildlife rather than rushing the fortress. Probably for the best. Jimmy Ill's barricaded auras encircled the goblin scum, cutting off their escape route while my squire and I headed to bar their path toward the fortress. Nemo 2342's constructs of light stood by, in case help was needed. As we were focused on the battle on the outskirts of the fortress, something far more sinister was happening. A troop of scum had managed to bypass our troops entirely and made their way to the trade depot. As soon as I got word, I sent a runner to fetch the righteous barricades from where they were sparring in the barracks and to direct the constructs of light to the depot as well. The time for subtlety and planning was past. I sounded the call for Jimiel to advance. The goblin with a teal background is flying through the air towards a three Z-level drop into lava. Which Jimiel did, leaving his squad behind in his hunger for battle. He killed three of the goblins himself before Hancor caught up with him from the other direction, and the two of them easily finished off the rest. I arrived on the battlefield just in time to observe them converging on the last of the hapless scum. Meanwhile, in the fortress courtyard, the goblin ambushers fell upon the elven merchants that were fruitlessly waiting at the depot for a trade broker. I assure you, journal, that I would not allow them to find one. The goblins easily brought down several of the tree-hugging cannibals, and I cannot pretend I felt sorry for them. They were cut down like the dogs that they are. Impressed by this sharing of values with the goblins, I almost considered having Holistic Detective stand down so I might enter into negotiations with the goblins. However, she was ahead of me, and I fear she would not have listened had I given the order anyway. I swear before Armok, no dwarf nor man can stand before Holistic Detective when she has the scent of battle. Holistic Detective and Orange Soda II fell upon the ambush force with predictable results. That woman is like a dervish with an axe. I'll have to buy her a drink sometime. I arrived on the scene just in time to see the aftermath. Goblin blood everywhere, mingling with the elven. I bemoan my luck at missing both battles by mere seconds. Seventeenth of Granite I received word of yet another goblin ambush. Perhaps these were stragglers from the earlier groups, hiding out in the mountainside until they found an undefended dwarf to attack. Royal II was caught in combat with them. I, not wanting to miss this battle as I had the earlier ones, and also giving the other champions a much-needed rest, rushed to save the poor pump operator. Sadly, I was too late. Royal II's body had been thrown at least ten feet by the impact of a mace goblin's crude instrument. I crested the nearby slope, 
and, looking down, saw the scum that had killed Royal the Second. Charging them, I swung my hammer twice, sending a goblin flying to his death with each blow. Sadly, the last one escaped before I could catch it and subject it to the same justice as the others. But as it left in the exact other direction from the fort, I am sure we will not see it again in the future. I fear we will be hunting down the goblins for months to come. Only today, a snatcher was spotted by McKeel, and just now, Tinny Tim has told me that he chased one to the very western border of our territory. Cowardly fiends. 26th of Granite The adamantine mines are going well. I only wish we had more skilled dwarves dedicated to extracting the fine strands of that perfect metal. I ordered a few more of the peasants to take up the craft in the hopes that one of them will demonstrate some talent. Suddenly I am brought some startling news. The Countess, V. Elish L., has died of... of thirst? I suppose she must have locked herself in one of her many fine rooms and finally succumbed to misery. I am told she was possessed of a severe melancholy for the past few months. This is a terrible occurrence, though I must admit I did not care particularly for her moods and methods. It's still a sad day when a dwarven noble dies. She was the reason I was stationed here. I will need to evaluate if I am still needed to oversee the fort now that she's gone. This will take some thinking. It is also a blemish upon my reputation that she's dead, but that will pass with time, especially given the adamantine I'm bringing out of the mines now. 28th of Granite. I've made my choice. I will remain in head shoots until I'm recalled to the mountain homes to bring yet another outpost up to standard, or until this place takes me. It is a sprawling hell of disconnected tunnels and mysterious constructions, but I admire the spirit of these brave dwarves, and I have had enough of living in the mountain homes, beset by the demands of nobles and noble society. I will step down as head overseer, and let someone else take the reins. I will also record here a current census of the people, at the time of my resignation. The following are the dwarves of Headshoots. Sprite 41, Breaksmith. Athlete's Footnote. Tree Raper, Rotinage, Picturesmith, Brute Force, Picturesmith, Frederick the Second, Breaksmith, Punacone the Second, Picturesmith, Mercenary Nuker, Rocksmith, Kutan, Metalsmith, The Strangest Finch, Gemsmith, Otto Print, Gemsmith, Tinny Tim, Mugsmith, Crackmaster, Leathersmith, Skay, Clothsmith, Malin, Clothsmith, Frog the Second, Glasssmith, Mortal Sword, Fish Dissector Smith, White Cloak, Friendsmith, Professor Bling the Tenth, Plantsmith, Spooky Lizard the Second, Plantsmith, Backhand, Breaksmith, Toxic Frog, Trapsmith, Robin Daybird, Catapulting Rocks into Walls Smith, Olesh, Tax Smith, Manic Mole, Murder Smith, Beeswax, Mandate Smith, The White Crane, Nothing Smith, Smuggin, the Dungeon Master, Cancels Forge Adamantine High Boot, Annoying Cunt Smith. Nemo 2342, Death Smith, Holistic Detective, Death Smith, Mofetta, Death Smith, Tyskill, Death Smith, Sorellin, Death Smith, Rebuilt Box, Arrest Smith, Traxus the Fourth, Death Smith, Frederick, Arrest Smith, Spermy Smurf, Arrest Smith, Jim Yell, Death Smith, Volnarius, Arrest Smith. Hancor, Death Smith. Orange Soda the Second. Head Arrest Smith. Samus Zoomer, Make Nobles Happy Smith. The Good Professor, 
retired overseer. Brute Force the Second, Arrest Smith, Robert Dedford, Dwarven Squire, Hellioning, Bowsmith, Golgozer, Firesmith, McKeel, Breaksmith, Tag Plastic, Breaksmith, Tremendous Majestic, Hallsmith, Volley the Second, Hallsmith, Spoonboy, Funsmith, Spanky Burns, Funsmith, Haiku U2, Funsmith, and then a couple of regular dwarves that no one really cares about. And lastly, a work to forever commemorate my time as leader of Headshoots. To the strength of the mountain homes, to dwarfhood. <laughs>